Hello, and welcome to our Wednesday Bible study from the Eubank Church of Christ. For the past several weeks, we have been studying the content of what is recorded in Matthew's Gospel in Matthew chapters 23 and 24. In chapter 23, Jesus has come to Jerusalem and has been at the temple giving a scathing rebuke and exposure to the corrupt hypocritical leadership of the Jewish religion of his day. As a result of the lesson that he had presented, there had been a great deal of stir amongst the Pharisees, and this will soon culminate in the actual betrayal, arrest, and crucifixion of Jesus. But as we move into the 24th chapter then, as we noticed last time, Jesus is walking around the Temple Mount with his apostles, and they are marveling at the magnificent structures that are there. And Jesus informs them that there was soon going to be a time when one, one stone was not going to be left on top of another. Well, later on that evening, they were absolutely amazed at this concept of the destruction of Jerusalem. And they asked him some questions relative to that. And as we look to the questions that were asked, we can kind of see a little bit of misunderstanding in their thought process. For as they are talking to him later, they say, Tell us, when shall these things be? And when shall be the signs of thy coming and of the end of the world? It is at least implied there that they thought all of these events would happen simultaneously. That Jerusalem would be destroyed when the Lord returned, and this would be marking then the end of the world as they knew it. In our last class, we noticed the first part of Matthew 24, in which Jesus answered the question about the impending destruction of the city of Jerusalem. We find that he gave many indicators as to what was going to happen, that the Roman eagles would be encompassing the city, that uh, whenever this had occurred, those who were in the know, the Christians, should flee the city because it was going to be a tremendous period of tribulation and hardship if they didn't get out. It was urgent that they leave as soon as they could. And many other signs were given indicating that the destruction of Jerusalem was at hand. And as we move down to verse 34 of the 21st, 24th chapter where we left off last time, Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, This generation shall not pass till all of these things be fulfilled. So the prior part of the chapter, the earlier verses, is all dealing with answering that question, When is Jerusalem going to be destroyed? When is this city going to be leveled where there's not one stone upon another? But now picking up in verse 35 and continuing on, Jesus deals with the second part of their questioning about when are you coming back and when will be the, the, the end of the world. And notice what he says. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. He said this world that we're living in is going to eventually have a day of reckoning. But in, even in that day, the words that Jesus had spoken, those were going to be there even to judge all of mankind. I'm reminded of what Jesus said over in John chapter 12 and verse 48, where he said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words has one, has one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. His words are not going to pass away. There are many folks today who seem to think that the Bible is passe. It's gone out of style. It's not worth our time and study. But Jesus reminds us that indeed it is. For these words will be in existence. They will be the criteria by which we will be judged. They will stand before us in the final day. Peter talks about this impending destruction of the earth over in 2 Peter chapter 3. And he makes the point that yes, there's going to be folks who will scoff about the ending of time. But he said there's some things they just don't want to remember. He says in verse 3 of 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they are willingly ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, 
whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth which are now, by the same word are kept in store, reserved against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come, as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Peter here is echoing what Jesus is teaching in Matthew chapter 24, that there is coming a day in which this earth will be destroyed and all men will be judged, and the words of Jesus will be held in focus as we are judged against that standard in that day. He says in verse 36 of Matthew 24, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. We need to let that soak in. There have been many people down through the years who have made predictions as to when the earth is going to end. There are many people even today that look to the unfolding of events around us and say, oh, see, this is a sign of his coming. This is some indicator that, that the day of the Lord is at hand and he is about ready to come back. There's no sign. There's not going to be any advanced warning. There's not going to be something to suddenly rouse us up and make us say, oh, it's about time for the Lord to come. And that's what Jesus focuses on through the rest of Matthew 24 and going into Matthew 25. It's going to be a totally unexpected surprise. Yes, we know it's coming, but no man knows when. He says, of that day and hour knoweth no man. And that has never changed. Even the angels in heaven, Jesus says, do not know when God is going to give the affirmative call to bring my children home and let's have this final judgment. He goes on to use an illustration. In verse 37, Jesus continues and says, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and given in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Even though Noah had been building the ark for over a hundred years, he'd been a preacher of righteousness. He had tried to live right in the sight of a wicked world. They still weren't ready for the flood waters to come upon the earth. And whenever the flood waters came, life had been going on just as it always had. Eating and drinking, having marriages and celebrations, life was going on just as per normal until the day that God gave the order for Noah and his family to go into the ark, and he shut the door, and the flood waters came. And when the flood waters came and the ark had been shut up, there was not going to be any other option for those people. There wasn't going to be a chance for a last minute repentance to come back and say, oh, I want, I've changed my mind. I want to get right with God now. The, uh, the time had passed. The option was over. God's long suffering, as Peter referred to it, is one day going to run out. And we don't know when one day with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. It will come in the Lord's good time. But it will come when God is ready for it to happen. And it's going to come very quickly. It's going to be something that we're not going to be able to say, Oh, well, the judgment has, has started, and I guess the end of the world is, is just about here. So I'm going to, in these last few moments, suddenly make some plea with God and get everything straightened out. Paul says over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 52, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. It's not going to be something that is protracted out of time. 
where in the final hours we're going to have a chance to suddenly race around, get right with God, and then be ready for a judgment day. The Lord is teaching us here in Matthew 24 of the urgency for us to get ready to meet him because there's going to be no advance warning. And when that moment comes, there is not going to be time to somehow make things right when we have neglected him and obedience to him through the days of our lives. Here in Matthew chapter 24, in the next couple of verses, he illustrates the fact that there are going to be some that are going to be prepared and they're going to be ready to go to meet the Lord in the air. But there are others who have put it off and are not ready. He says, going on in uh, verse 40, Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken and the other left. Now they're not going to be left to an earth that is going to be now filled with tribulation and corruption. What was it that Peter said was going to happen there in Second Peter chapter 3? Whenever he was explaining what was going to happen with, with the ending of time, he didn't say that the righteous will be swept away and that all these people that are left are going to have to just deal with difficulty along the way. He says, No, when the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. And then his, his next admonition in verse 11, Peter says, Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? When that last trumpet sounds, it's going to be judgment day. And those who have been righteous, those who have done the things that God has, has uh, commanded, they're going to be the first to rise to meet him. Paul talked about it this way to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. There is an urgency for us to be ready whenever that moment is going to come. Jesus is pounding this point home. No one knows when that day is going to come, and to those who are prepared, they'll be ready to go meet the Lord in the air. There are going to be others who are going to face eternal condemnation for their lack of obedience. There's not going to be some period of probation where somehow now they can make amends and get things turned around. Nope, that's not going to happen. We will be judged by the things that are written in the books about the actions we chose to do while we were in this life. That's what the closing judgment scene explains to us in the ending chapter of the book of Revelation. It helps us to understand that when that day comes, everybody is are going to be gathered together to, to face the Lord in judgment. In Revelation chapter 20, beginning in verse 11, John says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The need to prepare is urgent. 
this judgment is going to be without mitigation. There's not going to be some a last minute reprieve, some probation, and here's your second chance to get things ready. Continuing on, Jesus says here in Matthew 24, we need to watch. He says in verse 42 of Matthew 24, Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the goodman of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. If the Lord somehow did give signs of his coming, there would be folks who would wait to the last possible moment. They would live as they wanted to live, and then they would get ready whenever they felt the need was right pressed upon them. Jesus continues on in verse 44 here of Matthew 24. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Think how many times we may find ourselves engaging in activities even with a guilty conscience. We know we shouldn't be doing this. There are other things that we should be doing in serving God. There are things that are expected of us that we are not doing. We're engaged in some action of disobedience. The Lord could come while we are right in that very act. In the moment in which we think not, the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant, whom when his Lord cometh he shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him ruler over all of his goods. He says, Now, if you have done your duty, if you've been obedient, if you served me the best you could serve me all the days of your life here, then there's going to be abundant reward for that. But then Jesus goes on and talks about the servant who misbehaved, who thought he would have time to practice iniquity before the Lord's return. He says, But and if that evil servant shall say in his high part, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken. The Lord of that servant shall come in the day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus here uses these illustrations of the goodman who is protecting his house against a thief that is going to break in, or a servant who has been charged with a duty, one who does it right, and another who is an evil servant who chooses not to. In the cases of failing to be obedient, the consequences are severe. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus gives us three rather lengthy parables that also illustrate this important need for us to watch and to be ready. The first one in Matthew 25, beginning in verse 1 and going over to verse 13, is the story or the parable of the five wise and the five foolish virgins. I think we know the story, how that the wise virgins brought extra oil for their lamps, but the five foolish virgins only brought the bare minimum. And the bridegroom lingered. He did not come as expected. And whenever he did arrive, the foolish virgins realized they were unprepared. They didn't have any oil, or they were completely out of it, or almost so, and they could not do their job of providing lighting for that marriage feast. And so because they were unprepared, they had to dash off to town to try to make preparation, but it was too late. When they came back, the door was shut. We find that in verse 13, Jesus summarizes this parable and saying, Watch therefore, for you know not the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. He then talks about the importance of our redeeming our talents and time in the very best in service unto God. The next parable that he gives us here in Matthew 25, beginning in verse 14, is of a very wealthy man who is going to take a trip into a far country, and he divides his goods among his servants to take care of while he is gone. And those who had received numerous talents, they were very good at investing those talents, using those talents wisely, doing the best they could do with what they had to work with. Some had more talents than others. And maybe they had more resources to work with, more was entrusted to them. But whatever their allotment of talent, they used it to the best of their ability. 
And in each one of those cases, whenever the Lord returned and they were judged as to how they had done, they were rewarded and blessed and praised by the Master for the great work that, that they had done. But, but there was that one talent man, the one who just ignored his duty and his opportunities, and he just didn't make any preparations for the Lord's return. He took his one talent, buried it in the ground. He thought that maybe if he offered back at least the bare investment, gave him back what was his, that maybe that would be enough to get him by okay. Well, no. Whenever he gave his explanation about, I was afraid, and I went and hid thy talent in the earth, and lo that thou hast is thine, the master was not pleased with that. He called him a wicked, and he called him, in verse 30, an unprofitable servant, and he ordered him cast out into outer darkness where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He said, you could have done better. There were opportunities given unto you. Obviously, he had the, the ability, he had the opportunity to do something, but you chose not to do it. And so as a result, you're going to be cast out. And then finally, in Matthew chapter 25, is that famous story of the separation of the sheep from the goats. And here we find there are those who, even in simple terms, did the things that were expected of them. They did good to others. I was hungry, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was sick and in prison, and you visited me. And they were given a great blessing. He said, Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. But then there were those others. The ones who didn't think about anybody else but themselves. They did not serve their master well. They were not responsible for the opportunities that were given unto them. So I was hungered and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was sick and in prison and you didn't visit me. And so then they cried out saying, well, when did we see you like that? And he said, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. We all understand the wickedness of the devil and his angels and the evil that he is responsible for. Think of how horrible that punishment for them will be. That's who hell is prepared for. But for all of those who fell in step with Satan, that will be their fate as well. For I was a hungry, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you took me not in. Naked, and you clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and you visited me not. And then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or a naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? And then shall he answer and say, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment but the righteous under life eternal. That's what's going to be the ending result of whenever the Lord returns. We're going to be judged according to our works. We are going to be judged as to whether or not we made preparation to meet the Lord. What was the good that we did in life? Well, we may have a whole long string of good works that we did just to uplift our own personal image and to give us a personal feeling of satisfaction. But if we did them without being a Christian, God wasn't glorified. He didn't get the credit. He was not held responsible for the teaching that would lead us to do such things. It's those who are prepared and have given their lives to Him. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, we are assured that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So these passages in Matthew chapter 23, 24, and 25 help us to understand that you can't play at religion like the Jewish leaders did, be hypocritical, insincere, and very self-righteous and self-serving. That's going to be condemned and falling short. We can't have a false sense of security. But in answering the question from the apostles, they were told plainly the signs that would illustrate the coming destruction of the city of Jerusalem. But then Jesus launched into the lesson we've discussed today about the need for people to be ready because there will be no signs given 
as to his return. Only God the Father knows that piece of information. And so then Jesus goes to extreme lengths to help encourage us to watch and be ready. He talked about the, the thief and how that the goodman of the house doesn't just sit around and hope that he'll catch him at the right time. That goodman of the house makes preparation. A servant does his job because he could be caught unprepared if he did anything less. And then in those three parables, Jesus kept saying, watch, prepare, be ready. Because as he used in that last parable, that judgment scene, one day there will be a separation of the sheep from the goats, the righteous from the unrighteous. And the righteous will go into life eternal. But of the wicked, of the disobedient, they're going to be sent to that lake of fire. They're going to be condemned and separated from God from forever with no option to have any end in sight to an eternity to pay for the rejection of Jesus Christ and obedience unto God. So I hope we'll think about these passages. I hope they can spur us on to make preparation and to be ready to meet God. And if there's any way that we can ever be of help to you in that regard, we are only a phone call away, even with the restrictions of the coronavirus. We can still help people make their preparation to meet God. So if you're watching and ready for the Lord, good for you. But if you're not, and if there's some way we can help you, we hope that you will give us a call soon that we might be able to get together and talk about it and to take care of that situation. Thank you so much for studying with us today.